Debt makes us rich. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. To understand the difference between poor middle class and rich, Dave Ramsey is saying live debt free, and what makes the rich rich is they know how to use debt. That's the difference. You've got to create an automated structure so you can pay yourself first. So many people that budget do it because if they don't, all the money goes away through something called Parkinson's Law. That as you have an increase in income, expenses rise to meet or exceed that increase. And so I get why budgeting starts. And if you're a train wreck spending $2 for every dollar that comes in, listen to Dave Ramsey and Susie Ormond and go out there and budget your way so that you're not going completely broke. But if you're making more, then you actually need to live on, or you're making more and saving more, all you do is set up a separate account, just a checking savings or money market, and pay yourself first. If you have a payroll service, see if they'll send two checks, one to your personal account where you're spending money, and one to your wealth capture account where you're preserving money, right? Where you're protecting money, where you're building up a peace of mind fund so you have staying power, so just one financial incident doesn't wipe you out. So you don't have to go borrow on a credit card if you have a health challenge or a family issue. So you pay yourself first in a wealth capture account, just a savings account. It's not earning money. Will, you could watch my cash flow banking video if you want to know what to do to get a 400 to 800% better return on that and some tax advantages, but it all begins with paying yourself first, so then you just live off whatever's left over. Whatever's left over, just don't borrow to consume. That's the main rule. Do not borrow to consume. Use the cash that's at hand and continue to look to create more value. Invest in yourself. So what does that mean? Rather than putting your money in everyone else's dreams, in a stock market you don't control, in the things that you don't understand, hoping for the best, let's think about the impact equation. Number one, how can you reach more people with the value you create? Right? Dollars follow value, how do you create more value? How do you serve more people? How do you reach those people so you make that impact? The second thing is, the current people you're already serving, how do you more, in, how do you more deeply impact them? How do you deliver even more value? So invest in your knowledge, invest in your relationships so that you can expand your reach. You can expand the value you create, therefore making more money. It comes down to the impact equation. This is about how many people can you reach, number one, and number two, how deeply can you impact those people, which is absolutely critical if you wanna get rich in three years. The more people you can reach, the more money you're gonna be able to make. So if we combine the impact equation of reach and depth, with the value equation, it's gonna unlock your potential by recognizing the best ways you can serve others. It looks like this. Our mental capital times our relationship capital determines our financial capital. So three years or less comes down to your mental capital. What are your ideas? What knowledge do you have? What wisdom, strategies, and insights? Where do you have something unique that can offer massive value to the world? See, those that say it isn't um, what you know, it's who you know. Well, if you don't know anything, nobody wants to hang out with you. It's one of the most precious forms of capital is your mental capital. Have you got a way to tap into that and to bring that to people? But the one where the most potential exists, the most underutilized, untapped resource is relationship capital. People are the only true assets. You are your greatest asset, not that stock, bond, or piece of real estate. So relationship capital comes in the form of networks, organizations, customers, friends, family, and the bridge between your mental capital and relationship capital is business, and the currency is value creation. So if you have a money problem, it's never really a money problem, that's only a symptom. Let me be clear, there are plenty of problems out there in the world that people throw money at and it doesn't really help. It's really a mental capital issue or a relationship capital issue. So if you have the money to solve a problem, I wouldn't say it's really a problem. If you have a financial issue, it's either about the wrong information or lack of knowledge or the wrong relationships. You're only one idea or one relationship away from the next level of prosperity. So how do you develop, expose, and create more mental capital? How do you deliver more value, serve more people, and, and really solve the bigger problems? This is where you and I really line up. When you were playing the cash flow game, what came out of the game? Wasn't it your team or something? Oh yeah, I, I realized that I had to build a team, and it yes. couldn't just be financial planners or people that gave advice. I wanted people that actually lived it, done it, were wealthy, that spent time with wealthy people. And it took me about a decade to build that team. Maybe yes. a little bit longer. It was, I'm still building it was a heavy team. and you know, but I gotta tell you, it's paid off massively. Yes. I mean that's that's one of my advantages that most people have is the yes. type of team that I have and that I built and that's part of what we do is we build teams for people that way. Right. And this is the part that kills most people, okay? In school, if you operate with a team, it's called cheating. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So tell them, tell them what your team consists of today, because it's the same thing I say. It's my, my team is called my rich dad advisors. Right? Yeah. 
What do you call your? I call mine the accredited network, and in joking, I call them the financial nerd network because yes, these smart. are people that love this stuff. Yeah. I mean, even even part of my team is having a guy that's good at understanding liability insurance. He can read any. He can tell you off the top of his head any contract, how it works, how to transfer risk. It's I'll amazing. You, I'll let you know that on my team too. It's not not the rich advisor, but I have an insurance guy who reads all the insurance contracts. Yep. Yeah. And so he'll say, hey, did you know if we structure this with an umbrella, uh, anyway, not going to content, but with an umbrella, then you're going to save this money and you're going to have $10 million more coverage. I'm going, genius, but that's what he looks for. Then other people I have on my team is like an estate planning and corporate structuring attorney. Right. So my asset protection trust, but he's also someone who's independently wealthy, has done a huge amount of real estate. He practices what he's he preaches. very well connected. He has billionaire clients. So I was like, look, I might be, when I start with them, I was one of his smaller clients, but I referred so many good people to him that he brought me into the inner circle right. and has been great to me. Who else is on your team? So on my team, I've also, I do have a registered investment advisor that helps me research and analyze deals and he's also kind of my no guy what would why wouldn't I do this investment you sniff out what's wrong with it and how we protect it then I also have a cash flow specialist that his job is just to look and analyze cash flow and make sure I look great to the banks so when I go to a bank I look good because my cash flow is good collaterals right credits there and when I talk about you know you should have a team what stops most people from having a team is, is in school, you were taught that you have to be the smartest guy. Yeah. Are you the smartest guy on your team? No. I'm not the smartest guy on my team. If I were, I'd be in trouble, right? Because, yeah. because you always want you always want to room well, the, the people that help you grow. The most stupid people are people who think they're smart. And I've been that <laughs> person. You know, yeah. I know all the answers. I meet these guys who are PhDs, you know, MBAs, accountants, lawyers. They think they're the smartest guy and they don't ask for help, you know? And I was always a dumb in school, so I always ask the smart kids about stuff. So when it comes to investing, I look for the smartest guys that practice what they preach. So they're called rich dad advisors. If you wanna follow the rules of the rich, you have to have an amazing team, an intelligent team. And when you do that, you'll pay less in tax because of how you utilize and leverage debt and it'll help you acquire assets, and you focus on cash flow, not on 30 years waiting for retirement to come around. See, I believe you can't shrink your way to wealth, and ultimately, the problems we face in the world can be solved with the people and resources we already have, if they only knew about the value equation. Let me break this down into three simple parts. The first one is recover cash. There are five levers to becoming economically independent. That's to recover cash, that's to engineer wealth, that's to accelerate investment income, that's to scale revenue, and then make it count. We'll get more into what those five things are, but that methodology and framework helps. To recover cash being the first of those things, it's about the four I's. Finding if you've overpaid the IRS, maximizing your deductions, or taking on reclassification so you pay, pay less tax on the dollars you earn. The second of the four I's is interest. These are the three R's. This is about restructuring loans, this is about reallocating resources if you have underperforming assets that could pay off higher interest rate loans, or it's about renegotiating to better interest rates. So restructure, reallocation, and renegotiation is on the second eye of interest. The third eye is investments. It's about turning them into cash flow. It's about protecting the downside, and most importantly, it's about removing unnecessary fees that don't add to performance. And the fourth eye is insurance. It's about eliminating inefficiency or duplicate costs by making sure you have the right design. So that's the first of the five levers. The second lever is to engineer wealth. Engineering wealth is about knowing your monthly expenses and creating cash flow from your assets to cover those basic expenses. Now, the first way you can do that is in the third lever. It's to accelerate investment income. Where do you already have assets that you could turn into cash flow? Turn any accumulation assets into producing monthly cash flow because the game is about cash flow first, cash flow second, and cash flow third. Now, how do you scale your revenue? This is about increasing your earnings by adding more value, making a greater impact, and being more strategic with your time. That's the fourth lever. So the first is recover cash. The second is to engineer wealth, to figure out what your monthly number is and create assets to cover those basic expenses. The third is to accelerate investment income, which is make everything you have turn into cash flow and recurring revenue to cover your basic expenses. Then scaling your revenue, that's investing back in yourself. That's growing your business. That's about the things that you can eliminate from your life that don't add enough value, so you can do more of the things that add the most value, therefore creating a bigger impact, therefore making more money. And then the fifth lever is to make it count. See, you are your greatest asset, not a stock or a bond or a piece of real estate, so what are you doing to relax? 
rejuvenate and have some recreation so that when you show back up to do something, you're the best version of who you are. And it's about determining what success means to you. So you can learn to say no to things that aren't right for you and discern opportunities from distractions. That makes us rich. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. To understand the difference between poor middle class and rich, Dave Ramsey is saying live debt free and what makes the rich rich is they know how to use debt. That's the difference. That's why in 1973 I came back from Vietnam, my rich dad said take a real estate course. It had nothing to do with real estate. It had to do with real estate is debt and taxes. And I had to learn how to buy a piece of property using 100% debt. Once I learned to buy a property with 100% debt and still make $25, I knew I could make money off of debt. Yep. Whereas Dave Ramsey is saying live debt free and Susan's saying cut up your credit card. And what happened to your taxes? Well, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so debt makes the rich rich, right? Yep. Okay, now the more debt you have and the more real estate you buy, what happens to taxes? It's going to continue to go down. You pay zero tax. Yep. Do you understand that what makes the rich, again, everything is covered in this book, it's opposite. The more real estate I buy using debt, the less tax I pay, the more money I make. Your financial advice depends on who you are. So if you're poor, Susie Orman. You're middle class, it's Dave Ramsey, live debt free. Cut up your credit cards. Now we get to the rich. And the rich are opposite. And that's what I cover in this book here, Second Chance. Everything the poor and middle class do, the rich do differently. For example, I don't want to get out of debt I love debt. Now, that's what I hear a person say to me is, I don't have any money, so I can't invest. Well, that's a poor middle class thought. Right. You see, I don't need my money. The banks will give me all the money I want. And so last year, well, this year, 2015, we refinanced $300 million of debt. $300 million is not Donald Trump money. It's one third of a billion dollars. But we refinanced it down from 5% to 2.5%. Some nice cash flow. You know how much money way. we made refinancing three hundred million in debt. And how cheap is that money? See, yeah, and that's what's so funny, right? The money's yeah. cheapest before, but Susie's saying get out of debt. Well, here's here's a really or good. Ramsey is saying. Yeah, here's a here's a good couple of questions to see where someone's mindset is. I like to ask him if I'm willing to lend you money at zero percent, how much would you take? See, and if someone doesn't tell me they take as much as they can get, I know they're in the middle class or the poverty. Yeah. Or if I say if I'm not charging interest, how fast do you want to pay me back? Right. They should be saying, I want to pay you back as slowly as possible. The other thing is, are you afraid of a market crash? Not for me. No. You see, the other thing a person... I'll make more money during that. That's thing. it. You see, the average person who is following the invest for the long term, they're terrified of a market crash. And the real reality is, when the markets come down, the rich get richer. Absolutely. Anything you want to say about that? Because well, actually, during the Great Depression, a third of the people did have that kind of poor mentality, and you see the pictures of them starving and struggling. But a third of the people actually maintained the middle class. They fought hard. It was a struggle, but they were okay. But a third of the people made more money because they looked at it a completely different way, and there was plenty of opportunity if you had the right site. Yeah, and I'm preparing all the time for the crash. Right. I prepare for the market to go up and for the market to come down. And you told me this great story of a guy who tried to save his, he was a mutual fund manager Not who tried the, to the save. The largest us. mutual fund in the world at and the he, time. And he tried to save his he customers. He tried to right? move money to save the customers and he got fired because it was against the objective of the fund. He wasn't Did allowed you? to do it. I want you to hear that. He couldn't save his customers because he was a mutual fund manager. He was against the law. What did he do that broke the law and he got fired? He moved too much money into bonds because he thought the stock market was going to have a dip. And he was one month early. The stock market, as we remember, in October of 98, had a major dip. He was right, but lost his job at the same time. Because a mutual fund can only do one thing. Do what it's told. Yeah. If you, if you say, we're going to invest in puppies, you can't move them into kitty cats. Yep, even if you know kitty cats is the place right. to be. So the people who are buying that idea of invest for the long term, you know, if you're in mutual funds, you'll probably get wiped out if yep. you're investing in the up market when it's coming down, right? Yeah. You want to get rich in three years? You can't have loans beyond car loans or mortgages. If you have consumer-based debt that's eating away at your cash flow, that's feeling like a weight on your back and that's occupying your mind, three years is going to be highly unlikely. The second thing, 
is you can have loans if they're tied to assets that produce cash flow. So yes, it's okay to have loans if it means you acquired a business or the right piece of real estate. And that's creating more economic independence and cash flow today. Spend time with people that challenge you to think better and think bigger, right? That are your cheerleaders, that are your advocates, that challenge you, that create accountability, that excite you, that inspire you. I love spending time with those people. I come away feeling better. I come away, they wanna see me succeed. And when I spend time with people that are envious of my life or my wealth or the, the lifestyle that I have and they wanna tear me down, I don't want those people to destroy my confidence or my vision or to waste that time. Simply categorize three things. Who are your friends? Those people that cheer you on, that inspire you, that make you think bigger, spend time with them and invite them to spend more time with you. Who are the people it's time to be friendly with? Friendly means they don't want to see you succeed or they don't share your values or they're a drain on you. Say no to their invitations in the nicest way and stop inviting them to things. And buddies, buddies might not inspire you. They might, have, they might not have you think bigger, but they're fun to be around. Just spend less time with them, even though you can spend time with them and spend more time with your friends. You have to have upside potential where you work or own a business. So upside potential is great where if you work somewhere, you can participate in the upside, but you don't have the risks of the downside. Now, if you own a business, you can obviously scale or grow that by adding more value, reaching more people, or creating more consistent income on an ongoing basis. Now, you might even have a side hustle that can bring in extra money. It's known that 70% of Americans do right now. As simple as having Airbnb on their own home, to using the Turo app on their car so they could rent it out. I mean, to being a driver for Lyft or Uber. There's so many things to be done. Those are just the really basic ones. Want to master your money? Want to figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.